Manchester, centre of the greatest industrial sprawl in the United Kingdom. A city bearing still the scars of the Industrial Revolution, but yet a city of dignity and progress. Deansgate, hub of the retail motor trade in Manchester, and it is in an office in Deansgate that the first chapters of our story were written. Let me introduce you to some of the leading characters who contributed to the Ford show. Uh, they may say Ned Rowe and Clive Wilkinson of the Ford Motor Company. Jack Messenger of H.E. Nunn and Company Limited. Norman Quick of H&J Quick Limited. And A.R. Jackson, O.B.E. of Manchester Garages Limited. Jack Kemp held a watching brief on behalf of the Ford Motor Company. The three directors comprised the controlling committee and the general committee was made up of two members from each dealership. The intention was for the three Manchester main dealers to organize the Ford Show Manchester. But how, when, where, those were the questions that occupied our deliberations during the autumn months of 1956. Due consideration was given to the many ideas put forward by the six members of the General Committee, by the directors and by the representatives of the manufacturers. And slowly the idea was born to turn the City Hall Manchester into a garden showroom, the date to be May the 10th to May the 18th, 1957. And with that decision made, the problems began to mount. Budget control, printing, advertising, mailing, staffing, catering, preparation of vehicles, layout and planning, engagement of contractors. And so, week by week, the General Committee continued to meet, and digesting each problem slowly, arrived amicably and smoothly at a solution to each. It all took time, and often the Committee continued to sit far into the evening. But there were compensations. We grew to know one another intimately, and to respect one another's judgment. Competitors became collaborators, all in the interests of the Ford Show Manchester. And then disaster struck. The steaming cauldron of Middle Eastern politics boiled up. British troops moved into Suez. Egypt closed the canal and British oil supplies were temporarily cut. Traffic throughout the United Kingdom ground to a halt. The government introduced that dreaded measure, petrol rationing. And who wants vehicles without petrol to run them? An anxious time for the three directors on whom rested the decision to abandon their already considerable investment in the show or to stake everything on an early solution to these world problems. The courageous decision was unhesitatingly made to press on and back to work went the general committee to tackle afresh the changed circumstances. And so 1956 passed into 1957 and the ideas that at first appeared so mythical were gradually turned into concrete plans, paper and print, hard cold facts. Occasionally, individual problems seemed overwhelming, but patience and persistence were always rewarded. We were determined to put on a show of cars, trucks, commercial vehicles, and tractor and industrial units, the like of which a provincial city had never before seen. Much earlier than the turn of the year, a contractor had been employed to carry out our overall theme of a show set in a garden. Special turf had been laid down and treated to withstand heavy usage. Thousands of bulbs had been specially prepared. Actual growing trees had been scientifically treated for subsequent use in the city hall. Plans had been agreed for layouts of formal gardens. Preparations had been carefully made for the building of walls, fountains, moorland, countryside and seaside scenes all designed to set off the superb range of Ford-made vehicles to the best possible advantage. <coughs> the weather, which normally Manchester expects to be pretty severe in the winter months, decided to be temperate and mild, defeating at least part of the contractor's plans by bringing on too soon a large proportion of the blooms so carefully prepared. Time, which at first had seemed to be on our side, slipped sinisterly away until we found ourselves hard-pressed for this last vital commodity.
And all too soon, it seemed, came Saturday the 4th of May, the day we took over the City Hall. None of us could have felt anything but apprehension on that day. The hall, all three sections, looked so bare and bleak. It seemed so impossible a task to turn it into the showplace of our plans and dreams in the space of less than five days. Ford Motor Company's Alec Moore and Trevor Morgan had quite different ideas. From the wealth of their own and their department's experience, they set about their task with quiet determination, ably backed by the tireless show secretary, John Grant. Working from the plans prepared so many months before, and aided by the willing teams drawn from all three dealerships, they transformed paper plans into practice, paving the way for the main contractors whose job would start on the following day. Their skillful timing was superb, and the willing cooperation of their helpers quite magnificent. Sunday morning diverted our thoughts towards another channel. Action. Under the brilliant and witty leadership of Wally Patterson and Terry Boyle, nearly 50 of our combined sales force spent their Sunday sharpening their knowledge and their determination to make the most of this brilliant opportunity. It marked the beginning of a comradeship and team spirit that was to be a highlight of the ensuing fortnight. Monday dawned in a fever of activity in and around the City Hall. During the previous 24 hours, ceaseless streams of trucks and vans have been arriving and departing. 50 tons of sand, 60 tons of rich soil, and 15,000 square feet of turf have been unloaded by the garden contractors. A dozen towering birch trees in full leaf and complete with roots were awaiting replanting, and no less than 70 pine trees were on hand to complete the backgrounds to this fabulous scene. Ornamental paving and wall stone was stacked high in the main hall. Everything was waiting to find its proper place within the main theme, and the seconds, minutes and hours ticked away relentlessly. The 70 vehicle exhibits were positioned. Model T's, three of them, toured the city daily at peak hours, reminding the public again that the Ford show was upon them. Under the skilled hands of the carpenters, the centerpiece in the main hall was rising where three times daily our team of specially chosen model girls would demonstrate that Ford sets the fashion. The partsmen had taken over and were stocking their section of the balcony space in the main hall. The works managers were supervising the erection of their works displays, designed to demonstrate the accuracy and efficiency of that most world famous of all Ford operations, Ford service. The cinema was taking shape, where it was hoped 1,000 people per day would see films of particular motoring interest. And still the hours slipped by. Operation City Hall ploughed doggedly onward. Truckloads of display material, 80 tons in all, arrived in Manchester from every corner of the kingdom, some even from Holland. Giant packing cases piled skywards in the hall, but there were always willing hands and enough to deal with every phase of the operation. As you have seen, electricians, gardeners, fitters, display artists, sign writers, woodworkers, stonemasons, painters, and just ordinary laborers milled about in an ordered chaos that mounted in intensity as midnight on Thursday the 9th of May approached. Still there seemed so much yet to be done. Section chassis displays, used cars, tractors, crawlers, five-ton trucks, tippers, and Luton vans all finally found their allotted places among the thousands of blooms that gave the colour to our show. Meanwhile, the advertising subcommittee were moving into top gear. For many weeks, regular mention had been made of the forthcoming show in the local press. Now half-page and streamer column spaces proudly trumpeted the details. Display contractors were busy erecting their streamer posters. Already over 150,000 tickets were in the pockets of the public. Independent television had featured a live telecast of the details of the show and some 250,000 viewers in the northwest of England had actually seen on their screens the Anglia Deluxe Saloon presented by the show organisers for free and open competition in a contest to be run by the Manchester Evening News. At 11.30am on Friday the 10th of May 1957, before the chairman and directors of the three dealerships, Mr and Mrs Harold Mortimer, the press and 300 invited guests the Ford Show Manchester was officially opened
by Mr. J. M. A. Smith, Assistant Managing Director, Ford Motor Company Limited. In Manchester and in Lancaster. People who will get this passport to happy, safe, carefree motoring and all the delights that it can bring. So I have the greatest pleasure in declaring this exhibition open. The work of the Controlling Committee, the General Committee, the Advertising Committee, and their contractors was over. Now it was up to the 36 salesmen from the three dealerships to reap their harvest, and they went to it with a will. Easily identified by their formal dress, each carrying a carnation in his buttonhole, they drew favorable comment from all quarters. The reaction to the show by the general public demonstrated undeniably the ever-increasing interest in motoring generally, and Ford motoring in particular. From the moment the show opened, they poured in by the thousand, and the next few days were to show that the start, comparatively, was a slow one. Despite prevailing rumors of the imminence of new models, interest in the commercial range was overwhelming, aided perhaps by the outstandingly attractive layout and color of this section of the show. Every section of the show, indeed, seemed to draw its own particular crowds. Those operating the works demonstrations were bombarded with interested questioners. Much appreciated was our small but brilliant orchestra under the direction of Mrs. Mabel Hardy, a name well known to listeners to the BBC's Northern Radio programmes. Their rendering of the Five Star Ride, specially composed by Mrs. Hardy for the show, never failed to draw an appreciative response. And so the show went on, with attendance figures mounting by leaps and bounds. Sunday brought a short respite to the overworked staff, as the show was open on that day only to members of the three dealerships and their families. It was full steam ahead again, though, on Monday morning. Luck went with us throughout. Ford won the team prize in the Tulip Rally, which ended on Saturday the 10th. And by Monday morning, one of the prize-winning team cars had an honored place in the show, having crossed from Holland on Sunday and driven overnight to Manchester. Valuable publicity indeed. Entries poured in for the Manchester Evening News Anglia competition. Soon, extra staff had to be called in to sort the thousands of forms. Interest was keen, too, in the secondary slogan competition, carrying 100 pounds in cash prizes. Of special interest was the used vehicle section with its centerpiece bargain of the day. There, business was soon so brisk that it proved difficult at times to cope with every inquiry. The display in this section was changed daily. The fashion shows were designed, of course, to attract the ladies, but how the gentlemen loved them. The ladies comprising our fashion show deserve special mention. Apparently untiring and always before an admiringly appreciative audience, they presented a charming, fresh and delightful picture. Lady Luck continued to ride with us. On Tuesday, May the 14th, just halfway through the show, came the news we were all awaiting. Petrol rationing was ended. On that wonderful evening, and for the remainder of the show, it was full throttle from opening to closing time every day. The crowds flocked in. The 50,000 mark was notched up on Wednesday, with a record crowd up to then of some 13,000. Entries for the Anglia competition were soon numbered in tens of thousands. Fast-moving lines in the parts section had to be restocked time and again. Stocks of used vehicles ran very low. 
school parties responded to our invitation and showed keen interest. No, we didn't forget the owners of the future. Towards midday on Saturday, it was evident that attendance would exceed 100,000, the target figure that the General Committee had long ago set themselves, but which the Controlling Committee had always treated with some scepticism. That magical, mythical target figure was attained in the late afternoon, and the final count rose to 102,262, not including the special parties invited on the opening day. The Anglia competition closed with an entry in excess of 65,000, plus some thousands more entries for the slogan competition. It cost the evening news a week's supply of midnight oil to find the winners. Orders for new vehicles reached up towards the incredible total of 300 cars, trucks and vans. Salesmen's record books bulged with hundreds more names to add to their prospect list. Some 70 used vehicles were actually sold on the floor of the show and buyers from the three dealerships were already out to replenish their stocks to meet the many additional inquiries they could not satisfy immediately. Triumph indeed, the triumph of an intelligent cooperation between three competitive dealerships for the common good. And even as the doors of the city hall closed on the last of the teeming thousands, Ford were preparing another show implementing their policy of continuous improvement. On the Thursday after our show, the Thames traders were announced and we were off again to tackle new fields of prospects with something new to talk about. The Ford show Manchester was over. It was time to turn our thoughts and energies to new horizons. But we feel, as we are sure you must too, that this was by no means the end.